Welcome to the review video for natural hazards weather. This is a part of um, our preparation for students to take an assessment on the Summit platform for middle school science. But if you're not in Summit, you can still make use of this video if you're trying to learn about how air masses and their temperature and pressure affects weather, uh, how we can actually predict and prepare for extreme weather events, the different measuring tools that we use to measure weather, and finally, how we can use those measurements to make predictions about the, how the way the weather is going to look like. So let's start by objective number one, which is how air pressure and the temperature of fronts can affect weather events. So fronts are air masses which are moving and have different densities. The, the cold air tends to have higher density than, than warm air. So cold air will be high, have high pressure, will be a high pressure system, and warm air will be a low pressure system. Now, there are four major types of fronts uh, that are interactions between these air systems, which lead to different types of weather events. The two main ones are cold fronts and warm fronts. So a warm front is going to be when a warm air is colliding against the cold air and trying to overtake it. But since cold air is denser, high pressure, it will stay underneath it and be pushed against the ground, which means that the pressure on barometers will tend to rise right before the warm air comes. But the warm air itself has low pressure. And so it will rise over the cold air. And as it does so, it will interact with the cold air and moisture will actually turn. Warm air often carries moisture because uh, it causes evaporation if there's surface water, right? Now, as it rises over the cold air, if it does have moisture, it will form long clouds that tend to rain in very little precipitation over long periods of time. So like light, thin rain that lasts longer. Now, that's what a warm front does. After the warm front comes... That mass of hot air will establish a low pressure system that will continue to cause evaporation, humidity to gather in the atmosphere and continue to cause cloud formation. Now, a cold front is the exact opposite. You have a cold air hitting warm air. Now, because the cold air is going to hit the warm air and cold air is denser, a high pressure is going to force the low pressure air to rise. As it does so, rising air is going to cause a drop in low pressure. So even though there's a high pressure system coming, Low pressure will happen before it due to the rising air. Rising warm air that usually has humidity will very quickly uh, actually start to condense and cause massive uh, cumulus nimbus clouds, which are rain, uh, rain and thunderstorm clouds. And a lot of rain will dump all at once at, right before that cold air arrives. After that, the cold air will replace it. And then you'll see uh, sunny but not necessarily warm, but just clear weather without a lot of uh, condensation because the cold air does not encourage evaporation. So you have very little cloud cover um, when the actual high pressure system, which is the cold air, uh, over establishes itself in the region. So that's essentially the difference between warm and cold air. There are these symbols. Uh, everything that I've seen the screen uh, has been explained by me in the previous video. But these symbols are there to explain... Uh, what they are so the warm front uh, is represented by little semicircles of red and then you have triangles of blue uh where cold fronts are and ahead of these cold fronts if there's hot air here that's going to be massive rain clouds right and thunderstorms and if there's cold air here this is going to cause light thin rain as the warm air rises over it so that's the difference between a hot uh, hot air coming in versus cold air coming in and that the part that confuses kids though is that when the cold air is coming in, the cold air has high pressure, but the pressure actually drops right before it. And that's because of the rising warm air being displaced. Likewise, when the warm front is coming, that will squeeze the cold air down and cause a high pressure before the warm air actually comes. Uh, there are two other kinds of fronts that are important, but are not really tested as much in the content assessment, which is stationary fronts, which happen when the two fronts collide against each other and kind of get stuck. And in the middle, you're going to get a lot of rain um, because of the interaction between the fronts. But otherwise, not so much. And it's also going to be that kind of light precipitation that lasts a very long time. And overall, you end up with a lot of water because it just sits there for a very long time, raining, 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 and right in that middle. But if you're not in the middle there, you're going to be fine, uh, either with a sunny hair or a very uh, muggy, or humid air on the right side uh, if you're in that picture there. The occluded front happens when a cold front overtakes a warm front from behind and uh, moves faster than it does. And when it does so, it displaces the warm front and it goes underneath it, leaving a layer of cold air trapped by a dome of hot air over it. Now, that also causes the air not to move much and massive rain, like the cold fronts usually do, uh, due to the, all the air that's condensing 
uh, on top. The whole warm, humid air usually is going to have carry water, and it's rising over cold air. That's going to cause massive rains as well. But it's rain that doesn't move. It got to stick, stays in place because of that occluded front. Now, both of those can cause more air pollution and acid rain and things like that because they tend to sit where they are. And if you're that's happening over a city with a lot of pollution, uh, that's bad bad news. All right. Um, so this video is just revealing all of that. So this is an occluded front represented by by blue and red symbols alternating. Uh, sorry, stationary front. Loss of rain in the middle, light in long periods of time. You have the occluded front, which is when the cold front overtakes the hot front. You get a dome of hot air, lots of rain dumping, stationary kind of in place too. Then you have the warm air rising over cold air, uh, light uh, rain, uh, long clouds uh, formed by the rising warm air or the cold air. Anticipated by higher pressure, even though the pressure system itself is low. After the front passes, you're going to get a lot of humidity, a lot of hot air, a lot of continued cloud formation. And then you have the cold front represented by blue arrows, um, uh, which are red, uh, sorry, blue uh, triangles. And the cold air will try to displace the warm air by causing it to rise, which means the pressure will drop before it comes. And that causes massive rainstorms and then sudden uh, dump of rain. And the air that comes afterwards is going to be dry and colder and very sunny, not a lot of humidity in the atmosphere. And so those are it. Uh, stationary, cold, hot, and occluded fronts. One thing to notice, though, is that all of them cause rain, right, of one kind or another. And cold front is the one that makes the most violent storms. Uh, occluded uh, fronts also can make a lot of rain. But uh, warm fronts and stationary fronts will cause long-lasting, thinner rain instead. But in general, what you it's a good connection to go to the next objective. What actually causes severe weather is whenever you have high heat and high humidity being hit by a cold front. Which brings us to uh, the type of severe weather. Uh, what you need to know about lightning is that you need to avoid it. You need to go inside. You need to go inside of a car or a, or a, or a place that has light, uh, lightning rods. Uh, it happens because of electrical imbalance between clouds or the clouds in the floor. And a discharge of electricity is what the lightning is. And the thunder is just the sound of that. And uh, e each second in between, since the sound travels much faster or much slower than light, uh, is about one fifth of a mile. So a five second interval will be a mile away. So even five seconds means that the storm is really, really close. Better get inside. Tornadoes happen whenever there's massive collisions of really warm air and really cold air. Uh, and that causes a really violent updraft full of moisture. And if that is added to rotation on the cloud, uh, it, it leads up to uh, thunderstorms, which is what does tend to happen when you have these updrafts. Now, the best thing to do in a tornado is, is to go inside in a shelter that's underground, especially. Or if you don't have to be outdoors, go underneath a place that has like an overpass or, or inside of a vehicle with a seat belt because the vehicle could move if it's picked up by, by the storm. Uh, but ideally, you kind of find shelter as soon as possible and stay away from things that uh, we watch out for the breeze. Because uh, violent winds can reach, you know, almost 200 miles an hour on these violent, violent thunderstorms. Um, another type of special storm is hurricanes. They form over hot tropical water and are fed by that heat of that moisture evaporating and it starts with a low pressure system coming from africa desert hitting that water warmer causing the evaporation to start and then if you have added to that the earth's rotation and a wind shear of two colliding systems on top of each other then you get rotation and a spiraling wind uh, massive storm uh, is going to cause a lot of damage right so the size of the storm matters the pressure in the middle matters the higher the pressure the the higher the difference between the pressure on the middle and the, and the outside, the worse the storm is going to be. Uh, the bigger storm surge, which is the wall of water that comes ahead of the storm or behind the storm, and it causes a massive tidal-like overtake or flood of coastal areas that can kill a lot of people. You have uh, winds starting at 75 miles an hour for a Category 1 hurricane. Below that, you have a tropical storm, and below there, a tropical depression. But uh, you can go from a Category 1 all the way to 5 with winds 150 miles an hour and massive storm surges. Um, and, again, the factors that, that affect how strong it is, it's its size, the pressure differential, and the amount of hot water that it has. So when it actually finally gets over the land, it dumps a lot of the rain, it causes storm surge, but it stops being fed, and it dies pretty quickly because it's what feeds the hurricane. 
Uh, and like with uh, tornadoes, you've got to be prepared for this. You've got to know where you live if you need to evacuate because you're in a flood zone. If you don't have a house that can sustain the kinds of winds. And even if you do a category five, you probably should get out of the way. Um, you should prepare uh, cooking items that don't need to be cooked because you might not have electricity, clean water, uh, first aid kit and a communications device as a survival kit to try to avoid this. And you definitely should shutter your windows because if the if the storm breaks them, the pressure inside of your house can actually lift the roof apart and destroy your entire house. So shutters or boarding out the windows are crucial because debris will be picked up by the storm and certainly uh, do a lot of damage if you don't do that. But the best way to think to do is get away from it, especially if it's a category three or higher. Uh, not a good idea to stay in the path of these storms. Uh, a lot of weather instruments can help us measure weather. We have Doppler radar, we have satellite images, both which happen help uh, identify clouds are coming in and how dense those clouds are. Doppler radar is more close range. Uh, light waves get reflected off the cloud, and depending on how what comes back, you can measure the density. And satellite images is just pictures from the top, uh, which is better actually because you can see from which much really really far away the weather system coming. You got wind vanes and the nanometers which measure wind direction and, and and speed. Barometers which measure pressure and thermometers which measure temperature. All of which matter because you can tell if the storm is coming your way. Uh, Pressure, of course, can tell you if it's a warm front or cold front coming, which will tell you the kind of weather that's coming. And, of course, the temperature matters because that matters for uh, the amount of humidity and precipitation you're going to have in the air. And, of course, the temperature itself is another important weather feature. Uh, you also have devices that measure the solar uh, intensity of their solar radiation, which is a paranometer. And you have a hygrometer and psychrometer, which matter humidity, which, of course, matter for precipitation. And after F rains, you can actually measure that with a rain gauge. And we still use weather balloons to measure high winds and the stratosphere, uh, which are called jet streams. And their temperature and pressure and all of that can matter a lot because they push storm systems from one place to the other. Um, this is, And these are some pictures here of weather stations and some information about additional weather devices. I also mentioned in the other lecture series of devices that measure the electrostatic imbalance in the atmosphere, which can be useful to predict if there's lightning coming. There's ozone measuring devices, which matter for pollution levels. So all kinds of things are included in weather uh, uh, stations. Barometers are one important one. And they kind of uh, what, what you kind of need to know about is that as the air pressure increases, the measuring of the barometer rises, right? And uh, this used to be because uh, liquid barometers would be pushed down by the air pressure into the tube. But nowadays, it's more like a vacuum chamber that deforms depending on the air pressure and changes the sensors. Uh, and that even exists inside of uh, electronic devices like cell phones nowadays. Last but not least, how can you use all this information to help predict the weather? Remember, uh, you have two kinds of fronts and two kinds of systems that primarily determine the weather. So one of them is going to be that uh, cold front, uh, which tends to bring heavy, brief precipitation, followed by a high-pressure system that's going to be sinking cold, dry air. And that's preceded by a drop in pressure. Lower pressure, here comes a storm. And then afterwards, nice, dry, clean air uh, with a sunny sky, but a colder weather. Uh, and remember, the air, air tends to flow from cold to hot regions because it goes from high to low pressure. Uh, but cold pressure, it would be sunny, clear, calm skies. Uh, then you have warm fronts. And when they come over, they will hit the cold air and rise and with it cause light, long-lasting precipitation. They're preceded by higher pressure since it's squeezing the cold air down. But after the, the, the system passes, you're going to get a, a low-pressure air, which is rising, hot, humid air, leading to more precipitation and rains, especially if right behind it another cold front comes, causing that massive dump in rain. So interactions between warm and cold front will keep changing the weather that you see in your region, right? And severe storms, once again, are going to be preceded by hot surface water in a low-pressure system, all right, especially if that collides with cold air. And the type of precipitation you have depends on what kind of air it forms in or goes through. And don't forget that jet streams, which are high-altitude winds at the stratosphere, can push weather systems, and they shift up and down depending on the intensity of cold and warm air coming from the poles or the tropics. And because they tend to collide in the middle of our country at the those what is called a tornado alley, that's the area that massive storms tend to form the most because of the collisions between those air fronts. A squall line is just a line between uh, a cold and hot air where all the moisture gathers suddenly. 
uh, when a cold front is coming in, and you can see that actual storm formation. And last but not least, if you have a weather map, what you're looking for in most of the questions is cold fronts attacking areas of heat. So we have that happening here in Florida or right here uh, in the northwest in this map. So you have a low-pressure air that's hot being attacked by cold air. That's uh, severe weather is going to happen right there. And that's most of the questions going to be focused on that uh, when it comes to weather maps. And so that is a summary of everything that I covered in the series. In the other videos, I do it in more detail, but hopefully this is clear. If it's not, watch the other videos and I hope you find it helpful. Don't do anything that wouldn't make your mama proud.